What up, Life Church Livonia? Yeah, Life Life Church Livonia. If you wanted the thing without the stops, uh, I'm Alex. Welcome, welcome to Tell Me More. I'm here with Kate. What's Hi, up, everybody? <laughs> and uh, if this is your first time on Tell Me More, this is a podcast where we break down um, either. Th- things from the sermon that just happened, or all the things we wish we could have talked about that we had to cut for the sermon. And let me tell you why we do that. We do that mm-hmm. because discipleship uh, is a journey. And it's not just about uh, the event of the sermon or the event of the conference or the event. It's all the conversation surrounding those things. And so Kate preached out of Mark chapter 14 this last week and um, oh, chose the section on Gethsemane. Uh, and about how Jesus processes his emotions in a really um, healthy and positive way that really models for us what that looks like. And uh, she did a great job with that. But there's a lot of other parts to Mark 14 we didn't talk about in the sermon. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So Kate, let me start by asking you, uh, tell me more about any other parts of this chapter you wanted to preach on, but couldn't or didn't. Yeah, good question. So I really wanted to preach on um, Mary who anointed Jesus um, because I think that the relevancy of women being utilized in Jesus's um, testimony and his story in scripture is really important. And it's pretty countercultural to what was going on at the time. Women were um, pretty dismissed as humans with rights and they were seen as property. They weren't given the same, uh, voice or, um, uh, influence in any sort of, uh, complicated situation. So whether it was divorce or their word having, uh, value or their presence mattering even, um, And Jesus really went against the grain in that capacity. So he really switched things up. So when she anoints it, so I really wanted to go off on this, but instead of preaching about this, because what I do when I'm prepping a sermon is I read through the text a handful of times and I just ask the Lord to direct me in. Um, What what is it that our community needs to hear about right now? And so I just really thought that with everything going on in the world, um, with everything that we process through as humans, I really thought understanding our emotions and what to do with those in a, excuse me, in a healthy way uh, was what the Lord really wanted me to talk about. So that's what I did. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit more. So you mentioned women were considered property, which is true. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, that they, they didn't have rights. Their husband had rights, mm-hmm. uh, which is also true. Yep. And, and their fathers. So they, so it went from being under the authority of their fathers mm-hmm. to being under the authority of their husbands. Right. Right. So, right. And Jewish culture specifically in Greek culture, things were a little different. Women still were not as powerful as men, but yep. there, uh, there were not as many barriers for sure in, in terms of, of their rights, but they still weren't, it wasn't, uh, uh, totally equal either but you know anyway so that's happening Th- this this is an interestingly specifically jewish interaction mm-hmm. in regards to that because so why don't we read the text and, and i i want to ask you a little bit more about this okay and if you're interested in this if you're interested as, as specifically in the issue of women in ministry i would Oof. highly recommend highly recommend uh, the Evangelical Covenant Church, that's our denomination, mm-hmm. there's a booklet called Called and Gifted oh, um, so on Women good. in Ministry that does a really good job breaking down a theological argument for um, why women in ministry is a biblical stance and not just a cultural fad. Yeah. And um, so that's if, good. If, good if research. That's something you're interesting in, it's great. It's really great, I think. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, anyway, we're not going to get caught up there in this podcast, okay, yeah. but I want you, <laughs> as the listener, to know that resource is there, and it's a really good one that we endorse. Okay, so uh, chapter three, I'll start reading here. I'm sorry, verse Chapter three. 14. Yeah, I'm like, whoa, whoa, don't <laughs> wow. go all the way back. We don't that have time. So, we don't have time so for that, much, Alex. <laughs> that <laughs> <is> <laughs> so much context. <laughs> verse three. Okay, verse three. <laughs> Wow. While he was in Bethany, he being Jesus, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, interesting, Mm -hmm. a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. 
She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. I don't know what you make in a year, but that's mm, 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 mm. pretty, she's, she's balling on a budget. Yeah, yeah. And, and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? <laughs> she has done a beautiful thing to me. The, the poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body mm. beforehand to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray, to betray Jesus to them. So, Kate, tell me a little bit more about when you were considering preaching about this, what part about this struck you personally uh, in a way that made you go, oh my gosh, I would love to say more about that? Mm. Well, I think like from start to finish, right? It starts off with <clears throat> this woman who pours out this abundant, like it's, it's costly. Um, and so it cost her something to do this. So not only was it, this um, cultural judgment or speculation about uh, the sacrifice that she was making. But, um, but it was also because there's going to be judgment about her even being present. She's a, mm. a reformed prostitute, a repentant mm -hmm. prostitute. Mm -hmm. And so her presence there is offensive in general. Mm -hmm. And then now she's wasting, quote unquote, um, this perfume. And um, I don't know. I just think that there's some profound um, challenge in the way that she's conducting herself, a very sacrificial. So that was one thing that stood out to me, just her sacrificial um, desire to affirm and anoint Jesus and to be in his presence. Um, and then the, the next thing that really sticks out to me about this story is about how affirming Jesus is to her sacrifice and that she will be mentioned wherever the gospel mm -hmm. is preached. And I think that's pretty profound because yeah. if women don't have, uh, if their property, if they're not considered to be evangelists, if they're not supposed to be sharing the gospel, then why is it that her story is going to be told in memory of her? Why does it, right. why does, why does her sacrifice even matter? And so I just think that this text is so, so powerful. Um, and then just to see the greed of Judas and nobody really knows the motivation behind why he mm -hmm. goes to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious leaders to go and uh, betray Jesus. But I, would say that it has something to do with this the fact that yeah, this is uh, really the final straw for i mean this is it for him he's just like um what you are just gonna throw this money away let it seep into the the ground and you know i can, i just can imagine i just in my mind it it feels very connected and so mm -hmm. um i think mm -hmm. that the attachment to greed and money and where where judas um places his loyalty and his values For and the sure. difference the different the contrast between those two and that's probably where i would have gone with my sermon if i were to preach about this specific text is the contrast between judas and uh, mary the mm, the prostitute um, that's a cool i think thing. that so that would have been because where mm. Where are they at, you know, mm. emotionally and spiritually and physically in the way that they're conducting themselves? Mm -hmm. So that I just get really passionate about, um, you know, living our lives sacrificially and connected to the Lord and uh, where our prioritization is of our values. One of the things that really sticks out to me about this, and I think Tell me. why um, Jesus says that this story is going to be preached wherever the gospel is preached is because this story is the gospel. Mm, so mm -hmm. she, she was a prostitute, right? Yeah. How could she afford a perfume that would have cost a year's wages? Selling where her she, body. Where did she get selling, that money? Yeah, selling, selling her, her body. body. So yeah. she takes literally the fruit of all of her sin uh, and brings it to Jesus and breaks it open before him. Yeah. And, and anoints him 
with this thing that she got from her sin instead of using it on herself. She yeah. literally gives wow. the fruit of all her sin to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, Jesus is literally about to take that anointing to the cross and put it mm-hmm. to death. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> isn't that what? amazing? Yeah. I just noticed that while you were, while you were talking about it this time, I was like, oh, that's gotta be why, right? That this is the gospel, that Mm -hmm. this is it. This woman is not doing something aside from the gospel. She is embodying the repentance that Jesus is dying to create a way to. And, um, and then Judas, on the other hand, it's not that Judas doesn't want Jesus. He just wants Jesus and. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He wants Jesus. and, And we know from other scriptures Judas was the money keeper of the disciples. Yep. And uh, that he would help himself to the money <laughs> purse of the disciples. So he's likely, and this is this is conjecture. So, you know, we're connecting things in scripture, but he's likely ticked yeah. that they could have just gotten a massive influx. You know, think like $40,000, $50,000. <laughs> and this woman just wasted it on Jesus. Yeah. Well, and, and we see... I just think like, how often do we rationalize um, our lives and how we spend our money or our time or our relationships or whatever? We rationalize those things. So when um, some of those who were present were saying indignantly to one another that they that she's wasted this money mm-hmm. and we could have done better things with it. We could have given this money to the poor, you know, and they rebuked her harshly. And I just think like, it was better though, what she did. And Jesus rebukes them and says, you know, what she has done is better. And I just think that's so interesting because we think that what we're doing is the right thing to do always. Otherwise we do something different. I think Yeah, most um, of the time, yeah, for mo- the most, most, <laughs> most of the time, not always, but most of the time we're like, Oh, this isn't the right thing to do. I should be just doing something different, but but we normally rationalize what we're doing. Like, oh, this is the good and healthy thing to do, or this is how I should spend my time or money, or I deserve to do this Mm -hmm. thing because of all how hard I've worked or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that it's really interesting because they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. That money could have been uh, used for the poor in abundance too. Um, They could have uh, made more money off of it and invested and in, you know, all those things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how do they they're kind know? Of, they're kind of also suggesting though, they're, they are almost, and this is not quite the case, but it's close. They're almost prostituting her to, uh, for good works. Mm, yeah. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, this, totally. This, this thing that um, she's been selling her body sinfully and yeah. not that there's a righteous way to do that but you know she's on her body sinfully and uh this is, topic, this is the fruit of that right <laughs> yeah, right. yeah this is the fruit of that and they're saying we could have sold the thing you sold yourself for and helped so many people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um but this i think too part of why jesus protects and praises this woman mary here is um when it comes to 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 spending ourselves on good works or spending ourselves on Jesus, Jesus uh, is always the right choice. Always the right answer. Absolutely. And I think I have actually heard people um, use the verse seven, the poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. I've heard people use that <clears throat> as a excuse not to help the poor because Jesus says, the poor are always going to be amongst us. And so uh, don't spin your wheels trying to make uh, that equality or equity happen because Jesus even says that they're always going to be with you. But I don't think that was the point of this uh, part of the text. I think he was saying, you will not always have me. Like Jesus is the priority in this specific story not that we shouldn't care about the poor or serve the poor or do what we can to eliminate their suffering or oppression, right. but that, but that in this story specifically, Jesus is present with them. 
And the reason that that's a bad, I think, exegetical analysis is he's mm-hmm. saying this in the home of a leper whom he's right. having dinner with. Right. Right. So he's Why like, is he there? Why is he he's there? If he's literally, like... he's doing what they're saying. Well, we really could do, you know, she really should have done this better. Yeah. Jesus is embodying that yeah. literally with this guy who, if he's not financially poor, is socially mm-hmm. destitute. Yeah, yeah. Because he's a leper. Yes, and so, relationally. People are not going to touch him. They're not going to be near him. If and he's Jesus not poor in money, he it. is poor in spirit. Yeah. You know? And so anyway, I think that's a bad exegesis of this yep. because yeah. of the context. Jesus is literally at the house of a leper saying, mm-hmm. listen, there's always going to be people to take care of. Yep. Always. There are. There there just are going to be. And yeah. we should be doing that. We as and Christians, not, I'm gonna right. should all over us. We need to be we need to be doing this, you guys. We <laughs> need to be showing up and serving and supporting people. Right. And, and not he's just saying that while doing it. Yes, yeah, exactly. So anyway. Um, yeah, good stuff. So, so I get really passionate about that um text. I think there's a lot packed into it, as with many scriptures. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you want to keep going down the chapter, Kate? Or sure. Is there another part of the, the chapter that you were really <clears throat> drawn to want to preach and then decided on Gethsemane? No, I think that was the that was the place where I started, you know, because I read through it once and I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I want to preach about that. And then right, I right, keep right. reading it. And I'm like, well, actually, Jesus wants me to go here. So I guess I'll, <laughs> I guess I'll obey him. I guess Ugh. I'll be obedient. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about me. Uh, OK, so last supper, then. Do you want to read? Um, well, that's a long section. Maybe like 12 to 19 and I'll read like 20 to 26. Sure, sure. Yeah. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, Who, one who is eating with me. Mm. They were saddened, and no, one... Okay. By- uh, oh, wait, did I say 19? I did. You, keep, you, you did. Keep going. Yeah. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. It is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Very good. Um, so what things in this passage in particular, Kate, uh, what observations or questions do you have? So <clears throat> I don't know a ton about the festivals and um, the celebrations and all of the law behind what they would do for the um Passover. Uh, yeah, for the Passover. And so I just wonder more about that. I've read a couple of things. Obviously, you know, it's important to understand what that means and the relevancy of it. And some of the commentaries that I've read historically have talked about how Jesus and the disciples um, actually uh, celebrated the Passover the day before the actual Passover because Jesus was crucified on Passover. Right, so right. Um, that I, I have some questions about you know like well how do they know that and right um you know anyway so that would be one of the questions that i would ask and um one of the observations that i would make mm-hmm. um another one 
is it goes hand in hand with when Bob Hoy was preaching about the donkey. And it goes down to um, where he tells them about the owner in the house and um, the man carrying the jar. And um, it makes me think I I, I correlated these two this past um, time of reading because I was like, oh, man, I wonder if he knew this guy and knew his rhythms and his habits. And um, how did he know outside of, you know, omnipotence and being God and all? um, (laughs) Was it just like a practical thing? Did he just know this guy? Because he had lived life there for a period of time and just knew what his rhythms would be and had relationship with them. Yeah, the guy the where they celebrate the Passover. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, that. I've heard that a lot of scholars think it's Mark. Oh, really? Which is how Mark would know Peter and the disciples oh. and know about this moment and how Mark would know where Gethsemane was and have an account of that. Mm, yeah. Yep. Because in Mark, Mark's the only gospel when it gets to Gethsemane, it talks about a guy in a sheet running away. Yeah, naked. yeah. And that's Mark. No other gospel mentions yeah. that. And so, you know, like how would that, how would the writer know that person was there? They would have to have been watching it or be talking right. to one of the disciples who saw this happen, right? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, totally. So that's, that's um, because of some of those details that seem like this person, um, had to have been there or like be a part of this in some way yeah uh, that there's it's not a consensus but there's a number of scholars who think it was probably mark's house hmm. uh, or at least his parents house because he was probably like was a young. teenager yeah ish you know which is why of course you know because what a grown adult is going to go chasing the disciples toward Gethsemane wearing nothing but a sheet. <laughs> teenagers. That's, that's a teenager teenage thing. thing to do. That's a teenager <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> and if you're, because if you're grown doing that, you got trouble. Right. You, know, you show usually, up back like, at home like, butt naked and your yeah, mom's like, like where don't, have you been? Don't ask any questions, mom. It's been a rough night. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that's, that's what scholars think is probably yeah. the case is that uh, it was probably Mark's parents' house uh, and so Mark, that's how Mark knew all this stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Another observation I make, anytime there are feeling words in scripture, because, okay, so I know that I, um, I talk about feelings a lot. I know that has come <laughs> up a lot in my sermons and just didn't tell me more and what stands out to me about our sermon. Take really, I didn't days. even notice. Yeah, well, here I am to tell you <laughs> observations. Uh, for much of my life, I ignored feelings. I mm. thought that they were weak. I thought that they were misleading. I didn't think that they were appropriate. And so I did a lot of like um, stuffing them down and ignoring them. And so in the past, probably two to three years, I have really started to pay attention to feelings because they're indicators. I don't think that they should lead the charge, but if we ignore them and pretend like they're not there, they flare up in other capacities. So anyway, for sure. so I always am looking for like feelings, words in the text. And here it says they were saddened. Mm. And I think that that's really important. They were all really sad about Jesus's observation. Um, And I think that, I think it matters to pay attention to what makes the disciples sad. Um, They still all betray him though. They don't want to, they're sad about it. But when it comes to fisticuffs, I guess is how I'll phrase it. (laughs) um, They really do betray him. They walk away and uh, then it's pointed out to them or they observe or they realize it eventually later on in um, uh, the testimony of the resurrection. Um, And I think that's really important to know that there's a turnaround point for them too. So at the beginning, they're sad about it and then they do it. And then they probably have shame and sadness and uh, fear about the consequences of their betrayal. But anyway, I just think that it's really important to pay attention to the feelings parts of scripture because it's relevant. It matters. And we're not meant to um, ignore those things. We're not necessarily meant to make outright decisions based on them, but paying attention to our feelings is very valuable. For sure. For sure. I wholeheartedly agree. I also spent a long time just thinking they were uh, um, bad leaders for Mm -hmm. my life. And therefore, you know, ignoring them is righteous and Mm. leads to righteousness. And, you know, one of the phrases that I love from Pete Scazzaro is when you bury emotions, they don't die. They just get buried alive. (laughs) 
Yeah. And then they seep out, you know, and they seep out in all these really destructive, yeah. uh, unrighteous ways. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I love how you said that they shouldn't take the charge, but uh, they are good indicators. And, and I think that how I've, you know, incorporated that is feelings uh, aren't truth, but it is true that I'm feeling them. Yeah. Yeah. Feelings are true. They just are. Right. It right. Doesn't and, mean... and that doesn't mean that I have a, that those feelings are a good indicator of true reality. Meaning right. like if I'm super ticked because you said something and that made me feel slighted, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you meant that or that I even understood that in the correct way, which yeah. would be like kind of the truth of the reality of it. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that's how I feel. And so, um, that I think invites for me invites it. Why do I feel that way? Mm -hmm. Because my feelings <laughs> say more about me than they do about any situation I find myself. Yeah. In. But and, if you know, don't tell me that you feel slighted by me, that's going to seep into our relationship. It could, or it could be like, Oh, you know why I felt slighted by Kate? It's because I always want people to think I'm right. And when she right. disagreed with me, that made me feel wrong. So in that in that case, it's not something I need to address with you. It's something I need to address with me. Right, right, right. You know Definitely. I mean? But it Definitely. has to be addressed. Yes. Yeah. 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 But and sometimes it's okay to address it. I think some of what I have experienced is when people show up to me with their feelings, I don't need to fix them or take them on. Not everyone is safe or healthy. So we can't always show up to everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. with our feelings. But having people that we can do that with is important. Mm -hmm. Um so anyway, they were saddened and one by one, they said to him, surely you don't mean me. And I think that <clears throat> that dismissal or um, ignoring that warning from <laughs> the, their rabbi, really, this guy who's like, hey guys, I know things, you've seen me do miracles, you've seen me show up, you think that I'm the son of God because you've said so in other conversations we've had. So I think that they were sad, but they didn't actually take him seriously. Hmm. One of the things that sticks out to me in this passage is, uh, and I've said this before, deconstruction is kind of a buzzword right now in uh, particularly Christian circles that have historically been more uh, conservative or fundamentalist. But I think it's a big, it's a big trend right now that people are uh, quote unquote deconstructing their faith. And I yep. think what that means really is that they've seen a lot of bad fruit in their lives and in the church and they're trying yeah. to figure out um where is this bad fruit coming from and how do i make better fruit and what parts of what i believe are contributing to that bad fruit and uh well, how do i need to change that and so <clears throat> one of the things i say a lot to folks who are in that process is i think that um the last supper connected to gethsemane and peter's denial is if you think you can follow Jesus and not go through Gethsemane, you are kidding yourself. Hmm. If you think you can be a disciple of Jesus and never betray him um, and never fail him and never Ouch. be put in this place, right? Because Gethsemane mm -hmm. is this place where they want to follow Jesus, but they want uh, to not be, to not suffer more. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And, I mean, who wants to suffer more? Right. Right. But I mean, like no that's, one. that's the choice, right? So they, um, basically all abandoned Jesus. And mm -hmm. I think that this is almost, uh, not a, a rite of passage is the wrong word, but it's an inevitability in following Jesus that at some point I'm going to fail you and fall asleep when you ask me to step up mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm going to betray you in some way. Yeah. And I'm going to feel like I've lost you. Mm -hmm. And I and, think so many people want to put themselves as the hero of the story. Yeah. Instead of that, Jesus is the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be, <clears throat> we, we don't think that we're not me. Surely not. I am yeah. going to betray you. Right. Um, or crucify you even. It's right. easy to look at. Uh, the religious leaders and say, or the Jewish people who were, you know, crucify him um, and think like, I wouldn't do that. But we do that all the time, regularly, yep. mm -hmm. if not daily, where mm -hmm. we put our own wants and needs ahead of what Jesus has called us to do. Right, right. And, and, and that's betrayal. So if you're struggling in your faith right now, and you feel like you've lost Jesus, uh, that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. He, there has been a ripping where you and he have separated. I would just say you're in Gethsemane. Yeah. And uh, 
often this is accompanied by what writers would call a dark night of the soul. And mm -hmm. this is what I would consider part of the normal and natural Christian life. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not <laughs> wrong to be there. And the good news about Gethsemane uh, that we know from the lives of the disciples is the next time they see Jesus, Jesus finds them in a room yeah. they thought no one could get into. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so my encouragement to you would be don't give up because uh, the Bible is not about the um, the perfection of how well people follow God. It's about how uh, God pursues people despite our failures. Yeah. So I th the, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, yeah. I think is just so prevalent in our lives. We want to do right. We want to obey the Lord. And Romans talks about that, right? The doo doo verses, as I love to lovingly call them. <laughs> Why do I do what I don't want to do? And I do what I don't want to do. It is not, it is not uh, God that lives in me. It is my sinful nature. You know, that's yeah. my ability to quote scripture verbatim is, is not real. Yeah. So that's my, that's my, <laughs> in the words of the band, brand new. Yeah. God and the devil are a war inside of me. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. <laughs> quote it. Quote it verbatim, Alex. You that got also that. wasn't quite right, but some of you, oh. right, I mean. <laughs> you were going to get the reference. Bettina. Yeah, she yeah where is she at? She does. Yeah. Me? Not so much. I'm like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. Who is that? Uh, who is that again? Who uh, is she? Is she? I don't is know that working? band. Whoever you quoted. Brand new. They're great. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's Moving a, on. a 2004 reference. Um, graduated high school we've Ooh. already talked about i'm happy about that i'm glad you graduated thank you it was a close call yeah i'm sure it was <laughs> anyway um so uh jesus predicts peter's denial um it's interesting to me that this is like a thing yeah like a separate like on an ad an addition to him telling yeah you know uh someone's gonna deny me here and then he uh, specifically betray points me. out yeah. Peter. Yeah, yeah. sorry. But well, he says betray. you're all gonna you're all gonna betray uh, deny me. One of you will betray me. But then they dig in to um, Peter. And mm. why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why his story? Is it just to say that Jesus knows all the details, or is he his number one guy? And so he goes, you know, to the lengths to describe his level of denial i don't know yeah it could be just a, a, a consequence of you know he anoints peter as the rock on which he'll build his mm -hmm. church so it could be just that the, peter has a, a, a added burden of leadership and so yep. this is prepping him perhaps yeah and it's even a little bit encouraging to me. <laughs> I love when other people fail because I'm like, oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> it's like even Peter, right? The rock that the church will be built on failed Jesus pretty profoundly. That's a yeah. pretty significant disowning of Jesus. And if he can fail the Lord and still be used um, so powerfully, then what a gift that he chooses to use me as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we already talked about Gethsemane, so we're going to jump ahead to verse 43 here, and I'll read this section and then ask you some questions. Just mm -hmm. as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, <laughs> leaving <laughs> his garment behind. Oh, nudity in the Bible, am I right? I love it. I love it. So good. Um, so, Kate, tell me what sticks out to you from verses 43 through 52, other than the nudity. 
Yeah. Okay. Fine. Take away the fun part. Yeah. Um, I think that um, I I love where um, the uh, disciple cuts off the guy's ear. You know, he's like, "Hatsa!" I'm so angry about this, and he feels like he's defending Jesus. And um, who was it that did that? Was it um, Peter? Peter. Okay. Um, his, his number. I'm not going to deny He's you. Like, I'll child. never deny you. I am such a fierce warrior. Oh, I got your back, Jesus. And then Jesus in another account heals the man's ear. Yeah. Which is just so cool. I love Jesus. What a guy, you know, this guy. guy has, this guy has showed up to, um, arrest him and he's, he heals him anyway, you know? Yeah. Ah, so I just think a, re- that's, a real bros, bro. <laughs> yeah, just profound stuff in scripture. You know what I mean? Oh, I do. Um, so that's one thing. I love how Jesus confronts them um, with the, uh, what am I, leading a rebellion? I'm around you guys all the time during the day. Why didn't you do this then? And he really points out their, um, I don't know if it's hypocrisy or just where they place their alignment, Mm. you know, they, they care more about, um, the people, like they know that the people will be furious Mm -hmm. if they do this during the daytime while Jesus Mm -hmm. is teaching and performing Mm -hmm. miracles. So they have to do it under the, the guise of night. And I just think that's really interesting. And, and it points out, uh, just how twisted their thinking is. Mm how they how they're caught up in the wrong things mm-hmm. so and it challenges me to to say like where am I caught up in the wrong things where am I placing you know because preaching is really hard for me I feel really inadequate and when I preach and so when I um think about where I wh- why is it that I feel that way and it's really not about me mm-hmm. and so you know um focusing on the wrong things leads me to those inadequacies and fears. Mm -hmm. And so if I focus on just talking about scripture and talking about how it applies to our lives, it just takes away all that fear because it's Mm -hmm. really not about me. It's Mm -hmm. about honoring the Lord and talking about his truth. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's easy to get caught up and I'm just like the, the religious leaders really, and Mm -hmm. I feel really convicted. Um, Yeah. One um, of my, one of my observations about this, especially in regards to like losing Jesus, Mm -hmm. in Gethsemane is just what I think is part of the normal natural like I think every follower of Jesus has a season uh, where they go oh my gosh like I don't know a if you're there b if you're real and c if what I believe is true oh yeah you know I think that's just like a normal part of um, learning to own your faith as your own instead of just accepting answers other people have given you. I think that's just a part of maturity. But one of the things that I find interesting is if I were to sum up Jesus's um, message here to the disciples in this section, it would be, I don't need you to defend me. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. I would agree a hundred percent. I don't need you to defend me. Yeah. And there's a, a songwriter named John Foreman, who I really love. I think he's such a baller. His mm. band Switchfoot just came out with a new album. He's got this dope line. He says, we bicker over Listerine with Twitter as our liturgy. Ah, like, got him. Got him. Got um, him. Yeah. Anyway, but John Foreman says, uh, um, God needs no lawyer. He does not need me to defend him. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I think just again, it. Uh, Peter is trying to solve the discomfort of this moment with aggression, mm. and Jesus is um, comfortable with the discomfort. Yeah, and he immediately douses that aggression and defensiveness. Yeah, and, and just says, "Nope, we're gonna sit in this, and we're going to walk through this." Yeah. And and because what Peter's trying to do is he's li- he's trying to pass the crucifixion. He doesn't want Jesus to be crucified. Right. So he's about to crucify somebody else instead. Mm-hmm. Right. And and the 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 dysfunction of Peter's thinking is if I can pass who change who dies, Jesus doesn't have to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. If I can pass the violence from Jesus to somebody else, then everything will be okay. And Jesus is like, nope, 
nope, I'm taking it. I'm taking it all. How often do we do that though, right? Like I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be in pain. So I'd rather blame someone else or identify fault with someone else because I don't want to have to deal with my own shortcomings. It's easier, which is where gossip comes from, right? Right. It's easier to talk about other people than to talk about myself and my own shortcomings and how I have sinned or fallen short or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Peter I does think that. that's, I think that's such a, I see that myself all the time. This, this, mm-hmm. um, this desire to avoid discomfort by defending God. Yeah. Uh, in a way that he doesn't need. And doesn't yeah. Want. Well, and it destroys relationships too, especially when we're evangelizing or talking about scripture or talking about Jesus with people. It's, um, we feel this need to like prove something. Right. And um, there's this one time I went to <laughs> my cousin's. Um, can I, wait, can I, I yeah, want to just ahead. interject. I think that we are like Peter, we want to prove that we won't deny Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway. and we've also been taught to like defend the gospel also. And, and I have been. For sure. And there is, there is goodness and critical thinking around the message of Jesus. That yeah. is that is right. And yeah. and so when we're talking about defense in like a ideological philosophical sense, I think that's positive. But um I don't think that this kind of violent argumentativeness mm-hmm. uh and defending and you know cuz if I were to mind read a little bit, I would guess Peter is defending Jesus out of a desire to prove he won't deny him. Mhm. Uh, it, it, there's a difference between defending the gospel with sound theological truth and being defensive about the mm, gospel. That was really, that was really good. That was really well yeah. said. Yeah. So you were saying about your cousin. Oh yeah. So I went to this birthday, this little kid's birthday party. Um, it was my cousin's kiddo and we're hanging out in this, um, African pastor was there and we start talking and he was asking me how I would talk about the gospel with someone. So I was like, well, I'd kind of walk them through the Romans road, you know, and, you know, we've all fallen short. And so I'm like sharing scripture with him. And he just kept like pushing and pushing. And he's like, but how do you know? But how do you know it's true? How do you? And I was just like, I got so frustrated. I'm like, well, because of the experience I've had in my own life. And he goes, yes, (laughs) (laughs) that's where you need to go. Mm. because no one can refute the fact that I have had a transformative experience with Jesus that changed everything Mm. about my life. Mm -hmm. We don't need to defend scripture. Mm -hmm. The Lord does that in people's lives, Mm -hmm. standing up and saying, I have experienced transformation because of the power of Jesus Christ in my life is irrefutable. You cannot refute that. That's awesome. It's awesome. Yep. Amen, girl. Amen. Killer. All right. Whew. Um, well, we got we got ten minutes left here, and how many how many verses we? Okay, we're about the end. We about we about we about it. We about it. We about it. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Okay, all right. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Mm. Oof. Seriously. Intense. Yeah. Um, any observations or things that stick out to you in this section, Kate? Yeah. How did they, so the test of the testifying that people are doing, um, how do they know that they are false? 
because their statements don't agree? And what were they saying? Um, why, <clears throat> why can't they see the, um, in, you know, the inaccuracies of like, why are they so fixated on this, you know? Um, and then I think that, um, Jesus saying, I am, you know, uh, owning, owning the fact that he's the Messiah. I think that's super powerful. Um, and I, I wonder about how, I wonder about how they aren't able to receive him. Like I just, I observe the fact that they're not, they're not willing to receive him. And I just wonder about it. Why won't they accept it? What do you think would be some possible uh, answers for that, that would make sense in the context or in the text? Right here, I think fear. Of what though, do you think? Losing power. That could be, for sure it could be around power. But it's but it's also like losing their history, losing, yeah. um, you know, he's going to destroy the temple, they mm. think. That's what he's saying. Mm. And fear of, of losing this thing that they have identified with and were so attached to, because they say it in there, you know, he, he said that he's going to destroy this temple with, you, you know, that was made with human hands and then build another not made with hands. And that's confusing yeah. because they don't have all the information. When we are living in a state of unknown, it makes it really hard to accept what other people are saying. Um, so I yeah, think it's that's... such a, it's such a weird thing. I think that's a good question. Why are they so fixated on eliminating Jesus? Cause they've been waiting for him. Yeah right? They've been waiting thousands of years for him. Yeah. And it's so interesting that this temple they're talking about is Herod's temple. Mm -hmm. And I talked about that a little bit uh, the other week. Um, but basically, it's the temple God outlined for the most part in uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Exodus, but it has yeah. some amendments. Um, and that those amendments are keeping people from God and abusing people. Mm -hmm. and um they are so afraid of change and it could be like you said i think although it could be the change of power structures mm -hmm. that, that's possible um although they they do have limited power because they're occupied by rome but it certainly could be that yeah it, yeah um, within their own culture though yeah, they're, yeah, for they're sure. gonna lose yeah. for sure okay it could also be um like you said, that a redefinition of identity. Mm -hmm. And I, and again, I just see this as almost an allegory for uh, one of the things that has been really weird to me over the past seven years of being a pastor is I used to think people didn't come to Jesus because they didn't understand the gospel. But the more I have done this, the more I see this passage the people understand what change Jesus is asking for and they don't want it yeah. because it's so much change. It's a redefining of their whole identity, Yep. which redefines their power structures, mm -hmm. which redefines their place in society, which redefines how they worship God, which redefines how they think about what's true, which, I mean, it just, re it, yeah. it changes everything. And the same thing that is the joy of salvation, which is that it changes all of me. Mm -hmm. it changes my whole life is also why people reject it is that this is going to yeah. change my whole life <laughs> which I so often think is why we need to get to the end of ourselves right like for me when I accepted Jesus I had to come to this place of complete desperation the mm -hmm. gift I like to call it the gift of desperation mm -hmm. where I was so sick and tired of my life being what it was that I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to stop hurting. And if Jesus is, he was the last thing that I tried, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was like, you know, all these other um, higher powers and options and communities and whatever I needed to do. And it wasn't enough. Nothing was enough. And I was like, all right, fine. I'm going to try this God, God idea that you people keep talking about. And I did. And now yeah. look at where I'm at. And now look at you. And now look at you. Here I am. Here you are. All these and years. I think, and I think that's so. What we all need is yeah. uh, that gift of desperation, which nobody yeah. wants. Right, but. right. I mean, Jesus says he says uh, that same thing as "Blessed are the poor in spirit." And I mm -hmm. like how Pete Scazzaro says uh, 
People don't change until the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same. Yeah, that's good. Good work, Pete. And I, yeah, Pete. Thanks, buddy. PD. Shout out to you. <laughs> we should have like a gang sign. Is that the yeah. right way? No, I don't know. Pete. Well, we could just do um, uh, the P in the alphabet in the sign language. Hold on, I have to go through the oh, book. Okay. <laughs> G-H-I-G-K-L-M-N-O-P. Wow, I'm amazed at how much you know of this. P. P. I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember which way it goes. Well, we did a great job figuring that out. For all you who are listening on podcasts and can't see us, thanks. thanks. Just know we I nailed was, it. Yeah, doing the ASL uh, ABCs, <laughs> so American Sign Language ABCs, and I didn't do it correctly. I don't think so. Okay. Any any reflections on this before we've closed? We've talked about. Um, how the how Mary uh, lived the gospel and abandoning all of herself and her sin mm-hmm. to Jesus. Uh, we talked about obviously Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about how we all betray Jesus, and at some point in following Him, if we stick with Him long enough, all of us have to go through Gethsemane. All of us uh, lose Jesus and feel mm-hmm. like we um, we need to be found by Him again. And um, you know, we talked about. Ending with, of course, what we just talked about, just that uh, Jesus changes everything. And uh, for some people, that's why they want to crucify him. Yeah. And uh, are, are there any reflections on this chapter or on anything else from your sermon uh, that you want to close with today? I think that the thing I'd like to close with is that we are meant to be in community. We are meant to be in community mm. when we're dealing with Uh, sacrificing our lives to him. We are meant to be in community when we are figuring out what desperation feels like and looks like and and how to depend on Jesus, that we're not meant to do this in isolation, that uh, when we betray Jesus, when we have people around us to say that they're there for us, Mm. you know, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And it wasn't just about an intimate uh, spousal partner. Mm -hmm. That's just a general rule of thumb for us as people. That's why depression and addiction have skyrocketed over the past year and a half with COVID because we are living our lives so in isolation and fear and God doesn't want that for us. So uh, step out, reach out, um, plug into community, whether it's Life Church Livonia or another church community. Find a healthy group of people to be a part of because that's where it's at. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Kate. Thanks for uh, working through the rest of Mark chapter 14 with us. Next week, we're going to be back with Alex Sr. as he is going to be preaching on Mark chapter 15, the crucifixion this weekend. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for joining us here on Tell Me More.